I'm going to get off Alfie. Let's get up a little bit. Yeah, okay. I'm Austin Luca. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. Let's talk about Piazza. This week we are talking about Piazza. I chose this film because I was watching a TV show. I can't remember what TV show it was, but they did a Bollywood spoof episode. And I realized that I'd never really seen a Bollywood film before, or not even just a Bollywood film, really a film made in India. I've seen a couple of films from like British filmmakers who made a couple of films in India, but never a true Indian film. So this is something that has long been off my list and I just never got around to it. But boy, am I glad that uh, this was my first Indian film. Yeah, it's a good movie. India has a very rich cinema culture. And because of that, I think it's it's kind of a daunting task, you know, just because there's so many movies and there are new movies being made all the time. And they're really long too. Like all these Guru <laughs> Dutt, all these like Guru Dutt movies, if you look on Criterion, all these movies are like two and a half hours. You know, new movies are like three hours, mostly because they just pack a lot of stuff in them. In this movie and in other Indian movies I've seen, a lot of stuff just happens. Yeah. This film feels, which I I don't think it is, but Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong here. It feels very biopic, but it's not. I think it's semi-biographical. I think I read that like um, Guru Dutt, it's based on like some of Guru Dutt's earlier experience as an artist. Maybe it's just because of the length of it, or maybe it's just because of the way they tell the story. It feels as if a whole life is spent in this two and a half hours. Even though you're only with him for a couple of years of his life, maybe not even that. Yeah, it's a, like a couple years. Yeah, but for some reason, it, it feels like whole lifetime. Like, I mean, poor, poor Vijay. He just, he has it rough. He just cannot catch a break. Did you read the uh, Criterion, like, um, description for the World of Guru Dutt collection on here? It's like, a, it says, um, hailed as the Orson Welles of Indian cinema, cinema for his striking visual style and ability wow. to weave deeply personal themes into mainstream entertainment. Sounds about right. Or Orson Welles is the Guru Dutt of... Uh, Hollywood I don't know American cinema <laughs> that shot too where like um he's like at the the funny like microphone like when he's at like the his uh, university party like any uh he says the poem to the audience that shot reminded me of Orson Welles a little bit the way that he looks like him at the microphone that shot reminded me of Orson Welles kind of looked like him yeah there's definitely some Orson Welles type uh, camera movements, like in the way he he loves to do like these long shots where you start like super wide and you kind of move in. I mean, maybe not to the extent of Touch of Evil, but yeah, again, this is uh, his first of his films that I've seen. So that's not to say that in some of his other work, he doesn't do that. But the filmmaker that I was actually most reminded of when watching this film was actually Igmar Bergman. I guess. Part of it was because the opening image is very similar to an opening image to an Igmar Bergman film, which I cannot remember the name of for the life of me. But I can see the images, which it's around the same time. And I think it's about like a college professor. And like the opening scene is like a, a man in horn rimmed glasses laying in a like field of flowers. So it's it's very similar imagery. It came out around the same time. Wild, wild strawberries? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wild strawberries. And perhaps maybe like just that initial image was just so similar that I, I kept making conclusions similar to Igmar Bergman. But I think also much like Igmar Bergman, uh, this is a director who's very interested in faces. Like a lot of the film is shot in close-ups and very beautiful close-ups, right? It's, it's a lot of just a uh, full face or kind of profile Sometimes you'll see, you know, these kind of medium shots, but he's not someone who does like a lot of wide shots, except for these kind of like very passionate moments. And even when there are wide shots, like, right, they're like a thousand extras or like these kind of very gigantic scenes. He seems to use the best of close up, medium and long shot. But I don't know. It, it's got some Igmar Bergman vibes and maybe part of it's also just the writing, too. I mean, the writing's very poetic which i guess is something you would want for a, a film about poetry but 
uh, it does kind of have some of those striking dialogue that you see in a lot of Bergman films where it feels as if everyone talks in prose. And I think that's very beautiful. And then also just the Hindi language is a very, it's Hindi, right? Is that what they're speaking? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a very beautiful and sonic language. I, auditorily, like, I don't know. It just sounds nice, I guess. <laughs> yeah, especially when they're singing. You know, the, the, the thing about the the songs, they're probably, I, I won't even say they're songs, right? They're more like, uh, I don't know, chants, I guess, or something like that. There's probably another word for them, like a proper proper word for it. They're very repetitive, but because of like the, I guess, the nature of the Hindi language, um, I don't know, it kind of lulls me um, in a good way. Sometimes like if I if I watch a movie that has like a lot of music in it and has a lot of like singing with like people like singing in English, that gets really annoying for me, honestly, <laughs> just because like, I don't know, like English is a language that I'm very familiar with. Therefore, I get kind of like annoyed if you're trying to like watching a movie and it has like a musical part in it that has like English lyrics in it that kind of annoy you. You know, I think you're easily annoyed while in this movie, I'm unfamiliar with the language you don't even really have to read the subtitles, you know, after, I mean, you could read the first, for maybe the first minute, you could read the subtitles and then like, it, and then it repeats the lyrics. And after that, it's like, you can kind of chill, kind of like lull and kind of like yourself into kind of like the repetitiveness of it. That's kind of like the main thing for me that I take away from the, from the music and the singing of the movie. I love the music in this film. I mean, I'm a huge musical fan. So whenever I hear music in any film, Regardless of the language, I'm going to be excited by it. And I wasn't sure going into this movie if it was going to have music or not, even though it's a very famous Indian film and Bollywood is famous for having a lot of song and dance numbers. I just thought because of the vibes of this film, it might not have songs in it. But every time they broke down a song, like it felt right. Like it never just felt like people were breaking down a song to break down a song. I mean, they are, right? They just... Yeah. It's a musical, but it always just felt like the absolutely right move for the moment. And as you said, there is something hypnotic about their singing and it feels almost more like a chant than it does a song for whatever reason. Maybe it's just the unfamiliarity with the language. Maybe it's the repetitive nature of the songs, but they go on for a while, which is great. I mean, I loved every song. Like I said, you can just kind of like sit back and just kind of like chill. Yeah. And the images that go with each song are, are absolutely you know beautiful. Like it really runs the gamut of like different kind of musical type numbers. I mean, you have your more traditional kind of song and dance kind of numbers, like the one where uh, he dances with his, I think it's Mina, uh, when he's dancing like in the fog. And, you know, it's just the two of them dancing and singing. Or is it Galoop? I'm getting the names mixed up, but it's whoever the his girlfriend was in um, school. I think that's Mina. Okay. I think it was her. And that's, you know, very like traditional, beautiful kind of uh, Hollywood style, uh, sing in the rain kind of thing. But then you have my favorite song, a head massage, oil massage one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's just like a guy walking around singing and fucking with people's heads. I love that song. It's funny you mentioned that, you know, they have this World of Guru Dutt collection. I only watched one Guru Dutt movie, but they do have like a video on here called where Mira Nair, she's like a, a famous, I don't know if she's Indian or Indian American, but she's a, she's a filmmaker and she still makes movies and she's made tons of movies over the past several decades. And um, it's just like a 12 minute video where she's talking about Guru Dutt, why he's great, kind of like some history about him. It was a good video. And she says that, that the uh, head massage oil like trap song is like, at least maybe when she was a kid, uh, maybe not now, but I don't know, but it's a very popular song. Like apparently it's like sung a lot, like in like Indian households and stuff like that. Like I said, you know, she's like older. I think she's probably one in her fifties or sixties. So maybe that's not the case anymore, or maybe she's exaggerating. I don't really know, but I don't know. She said that like, it was like, it's a very like just well-known singing bit in households is it well known because of the film or was it like already a, a well-known song before the film and they just adapted it i i think i think it's original to the film okay well i love it i i mean i think it's an absolute blast i mean all the music is great in this but that one is just 
I don't know. There's just something about it. Like it's like jazzy, but it's like also kind of like folksy and all the songs are very repetitive, but that's probably like the most repetitive one. Like it's very just like, I mean, there's only like six lines in the song, right? Yeah. The song is him like <laughs> accosting people to have like an oil, like hair massage thing. I love it. What's your favorite song in the film? I like the one that he sings um near the end before he's like arrested. No, not before he's arrested. Like, um, trying to think it's like the it's like when he is in the auditorium like at his death anniversary i think it's at his death anniversary yeah where he comes in and he's just like fuck it's his fuck you song <laughs> i love that that sucks by the way i think like the singing in the movie i believe all the singing is dubbed like all the singing is different people which you can kind of tell but it doesn't really matter anyway yeah like the the singing performance in that one in particular is very great and the content lyrically is also really great and uh it's a quite uh an emotional explosive moment i love that part where like he's um singing and it's kind of like zoomed on him and everybody's kind of like grabbing him and it zooms out to the big crowd it's really great what a very powerful scene and just this beautiful moment right because we start on this close-up of him singing this song with the this beautiful silhouette light pouring in behind him and we pull out and you see all just i mean hundreds of extras just like crowding around him and him you know being pulled away and like just people fucking going at each other throwing fists every way and yeah the beautiful music just coming up behind it this is such a powerful moment after all of just this pain and suffering that vijay has been going through for like two and a half hours I will say like this movie's great because it kind of goes into a lot of like unexpected directions, especially in the last like maybe third of the movie where you're just like, whoa, okay, <laughs> like this is crazy. Like it, it's really great. Like I said, like these Indian movies, they really pack a lot of stuff in there. They got music, drama, comedy. Like I said, they just like really, really like pack it full of like stuff so that you really feel like even though it is a long movie, which honestly like the majority of people unfortunately they see a movie that's like over two hours and they're just like no i'm not doing it you know like i can't do it like but i mean i don't know it's a big investment no i know i know but but at least when if you watch this movie and probably maybe not every single indian movie but a lot of like the really great ones that are really long you do get a lot out of it anyway like this movie it's it's about a guy named vijay as we discussed and I think the movie is all about kind of like making art in a market based kind of like society. That's I think that's what the movie is kind of all about and kind of like the frustration and just kind of unfairness of it. And, you know, Vijay, he's like a poet and he's really good. Like it's evident that he's really good and he's obviously poor. He's homeless. He goes home to like see his mom. His mom is like, here, have some food, have some money. His brothers hate him because they think he's a bum. <laughs> Like it just like right from the beginning. I mean, he's just like getting kicked around a lot, but he also he's also very proud as well, though. There's the sense for some reason that everyone just absolutely hates Vijay for no like particular reason. He didn't do it. He's not a bad person. He didn't do anything bad. They just think he's like lazy and like his brother just think he's like a bum and like not contributing anything. I mean, he's, you know, he's working. He's he's trying. We learn that he tries to write these poems that are immediately thrown in the waste bin. And then, of course, he goes home and his brothers had sold his great poetry for like 10 anas, which I, I whatever, I don't know what currency that is. Probably very little money. I'm again, <laughs> like a couple of pennies, probably because they're like, we sold it for waste paper. And, you know, he's got to go around. He's exploring. And that's when he meets. Is that Mina that he meets that is working as a lady of the night? Did I get that right? Yes, she's a prostitute, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I wasn't like 100% on that, but I was pretty I was pretty sure. Yeah, it's not his girlfriend from school. It's a, someone else. Okay, because there, there's a couple of different like female. There's like two. There's Golub, who he ends up with at the end. And there's Mina. Yeah, who's his girlfriend, I think, from school. Okay, is it just the two of them? I thought there's, for some reason, I thought there's a third person. Maybe not. Who's the third person? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's probably just the two of them. <laughs> I can't think of any. I mean, there are other female characters, which by the way, the female, as Mira Nair says in the movie, Guru Dutt has like a lot of like compassion and gives a lot of material to the female characters. And I think that's pretty consistent over his movies. Yeah. I mean, honestly, most of the main characters in this, other than Vijay, are female characters. 
and I guess the antagonist is a male character because like the the main guy the uh, villain I guess of the film is uh he's basically just like the Indian version of Richard Burton I mean he's got the glasses he's got the whole <laughs> that scholarly look to him and he's like a a publisher I guess yeah he's an evil publisher he's an evil publisher and he he hears one of Vijay's poems and hires him on as an assistant I guess like his plan is like to hire him on as assistant so like he can somehow get control of his poems because he doesn't want to publish them even though like uh the guy Vijay's an assistant to is like these are like this is quality shit like these are good poems but He's adamant about not publishing them because he's like, we only pu- publish great poets. And I think that kind of goes back to the uh, thematic ideas of this film, you know, as you were saying, kind of producing art in a commercial world and that sort of perpetuating sense where the famous poets, right, continue to be famous because they were famous before. So it's just kind of like the same six poets, right? Or it, it's it's kind of like labels, like buying up all of like the... Um recordings and stuff of like bob dylan and neil young but they could have used (laughs) that money to like further like support like new and Mm -hmm. developing artists who have like new and interesting things to say yeah and i mean i guess it's it's kind of always been that way right like it's too much of a risk and i guess even in just like poetry publishing it's still a risk you say it's like he had a plan of taking control of of uh, vijay's poetry i don't think he had any plan at all i think he just randomly hired him and then he got lucky he definitely gets lucky in the like middle third or I don't know, third quarter of the film. But I guess why then does he originally hire? Cause like, he's got to think cause he hears his poem and he hires him. So he's got to think like there's something there. Cause like he could hire anyone as an assistant. He just needed a new assistant and he saw a guy who's like a writer or a poet and he publishes poetry. So he's like, do you want a job? It doesn't make any sense, but I, I think it's just that simple. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's just kind of random, but I don't know. And he hates it. He hates the job. It's shitty. He gets kicked around. He was thinking he was going to get his poetry published, but he's just like working as an assistant. I love that scene where like he uh, walks into the office like after he's first hired, because that's the assumption, right? That's and they kind of play with that in the film, too, right? Because you as the viewer assume, oh, he's hiring him on to like publish his content and he keeps going yo do you want me to read this do you want to read it like he's going back and forth and the guy just like keeps talking over him and of course like all of the scenes up to this point and continuing on through most of this film they're just there to kick Vijay while he's down like just just fuck him <laughs> he's just his poor assistant and his work is is trash as uh I can't remember the exact uh phrasing that he uses but like something about like novice trash or some some shit like that yeah right and of course he's wrong it's evident that he's very good right (laughs) as as we see later in the movie like you said it's just like him being continually kicked (laughs) even though like he has has basically nothing there's never a moment where they're just like he like becomes rich or like he he's just basically throughout the whole movie just kind of like the only thing he really wants to do is like create his work and then share it because it is evidently good, but as we discussed, like market forces that are just kind of unreasonable and are keeping it from being uh, proliferated, even though, once again, it's evidently good. Yeah, poor Vijay. I mean, every time you think he's, he's finally got done something with his life, right? Every time you think like he's finally like moved up the ladder, because of course, like in a traditional Hollywood film, right? You, you start at the bottom and then you kind of slowly work your way up and then you know you get to the top and you have this big celebratory moment but this is sort of uh the antithesis to that because he starts at the bottom right he's kicked out of his own home he's homeless he's sleeping on the streets and you think okay you know he's gonna get this job and then he's gonna get his poetry published and then you know everyone's gonna love him and all this stuff and yet every single time like every single step forward it's two steps back every time there's like the slightest advantage like someone finds his poetry and they're like oh this stuff is good suddenly you know he's he's kicked down for example the mina relationship he and mina get into a thing and of course the husband just happens to be his employer so and as is established many times in the movie she just kind of cares about like comfort and money not really about love which is like not really like necessarily a bad thing but you'll probably be kind of unhappy if that's all you're seeking. 
One other interesting about, thing about Vijay's poetry is that also it's kind of about poverty and destitution. So I think also that keeps him from being like initially published because it's just like because it's sad, right? It's not. It's sad. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what everyone keeps like telling him. It's like your poetry is too sad. Yeah. At the party, right? Everybody's like, like you have like the famous poets there, and all their poems are very, I don't know, like kind of pretty. But Vijay's poetry is very like dark, <laughs> and uh, you like I said, kind of about poverty and destitution and heartbreak. Oh, that's a a wonderful scene. And then for some reason, the first thing I thought of when I saw that scene was uh, that scene from Coming to America, where uh, never seen the movie. You've never seen Coming to America? No. You should watch it. I mean, it's not like a great film, but I was surprised by how enjoyable the film is. But anyways, in Coming to America, there's a scene where the prince, who of course wasn't right, he he's working like in America, and he's like a working at like a a minimum wage job, and his boss, the owner of this like McDonald's like food chain, invites him to a party, and he's like, yeah, I'd love to come to a party, and then he ends up being like a he asked him to be like a servant at the party. Yeah, that's exactly what happens here. I guess the only difference is that like right away, he says like, you should come to the party and help me throw it. <laughs> like he doesn't invite him under false pretenses. He doesn't invite him. He's like, you will come to my house. This is something you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's part of his job. Like, Yeah. <laughs> and I love that scene because, and this reminds me of uh, that scene in The Graduate right after the daughter learns that He's been sleeping with Mrs. Robinson and she's in the corner, but he starts singing a song and it starts as a close up of him like scrunched in a corner and then it like slowly pulls back uh, and you see the whole crowd and he sings his whole song and it's very beautiful and sad and I don't know if it's comedic relief or how you would describe it, but right after he finishes his song, because after everyone finishes their poetry, uh, the whole group's like, oh, excellent work. You know, we're, we're, yeah. they're all clapping yeah. and all that. And then uh, when he finishes, like one person's like, oh, excellent. You know, people are sheep, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> once again, it, it's evident that it's great and amazing and beautiful, but he's not a famous guy. It, it just kind of shows you that people, they'd rather bandwagon than take their chances on someone who is up and coming or not even up and coming, but completely obscure. Yeah, it's again, it's one of those moments, right, where you expect like, because uh, one of the other poets is like, oh, anyone could be a poet, right? Servants could be a poet, everyone. And of course, it shows the hypocrisy of these, you know, supposed great poets themselves, because they're like, anyone could be a poet, and we should let this guy talk. Because they're rich and assholes, yeah. Right. <laughs> the rich assholes, and they're like, oh, you know, not just the aristocrats can be poets, but then of course, when they hear anyone who isn't them read poetry, like even though they quote unquote, listen to them, like they immediately just like, fuck off. <laughs> it it is funny yeah when like the, they don't react <laughs> it, it, it's good I, I like guru Dutt. i like guru Dutt as an actor i think he's pretty good he he's like a handsome guy but he's not like not too handsome he's not unrealistically handsome i think he kind of he's kind of like orson wells i hate to kind of like bring comparisons to him again but just you know orson wells i wouldn't say he's like extremely handsome but he is quite handsome he's a good looking guy yeah He's a good looking guy, but he he kind of also, he seems normal. You know, he seems like a normal looking guy. I mean, maybe Orson Welles is the wrong person to compare him in terms of looks because he does have a very unusual like face, you know, that kind of makes him stand out. But Guru Dutt, you know, he has these like great eyes and he has a, he, I think he has good stage presence, kind of like Orson Welles. And I think he's, I think he's a good actor. Yeah, I think uh, all of the performances in this are incredible. Everyone really gives 100% in this, you know, whether they're going for comedic or dramatic it always just feels right and all these characters just feel so well defined i mean despite the fact that you have you know these very different characters doing these very different things living these very different lives everyone just feels so well established and i know we talk about how you know a lot of these indian movies they're really long and two and a half hours for a movie i think is long and yet as you were saying before there's just so much packed into these films and it feels like we know these characters like so much more than so many other two and a half hour movies i mean i feel like so many two and a half hour movies it's kind of you know you know a lot about one character but you don't really like everyone else is kind of just like uh i don't know they're just sideshows right they're just there to elevate the main character where this it feels like an entire world is established like you really know a lot about all of these different characters and they all exist within this particular cinematic world and they all have their own lives and they all have their own 
problems and issues. And I think that's something that is not easily done. And I think should certainly be applauded because, you know, you talk about any of these different characters in the film and you have like an exact idea of who they are, you know, how they grew up, what their life is like, what like their ideals are and all these different ways, not only they're related to Vijay, but you know, how they exist in their own world. Yeah. And I I think it's also really evident with like the female characters. Like I said, I think both of them are really great. You know, they have completely different perspectives and they are tragic and they're sad and they're like really well defined. And I think both of the actors in those roles too are like very very good and you know we learn a lot about them and kind of like their desires and yeah i couldn't agree more those two characters are are very good just that trio of characters is uh sick it's awesome i think uh mina and galoob are two i don't know if i'm pronouncing galoob's name right probably not but i think the two of them are a very interesting juxtaposition and something that they explore a lot in this film is not only poverty, which of course is the uh, theme of a lot of Vijay's poetry, but also... In his life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also the the steps we take to justify right, a, a means to an end. And these ways in which perhaps from certain perspectives seem immoral, right? Only doing things for quote unquote the money. But as they kind of make evident a lot of times in a film, like it is... Like money is not just about like having money, like it's different characters say throughout the film, it's, you know, it's to feed us, right? It, it's to house us. It's, you know, money is, is so much more than just pieces of paper or numbers in your bank account. It's, I think, something that they make very evident in this film, which is like, you know, when you see rich people say, uh, you know, money doesn't matter, right? No one needs money. Like, you know, I, I don't uh, concern myself with money. Uh, it's no coincidence that all these people are already extremely wealthy in their own right because at a certain level you know once you have a certain amount of money once you have a certain amount of luxuries money doesn't matter but you know if you're living on the streets money most certainly does matter and you know even though Mina doesn't marry for love and she shouldn't necessarily be justified in marrying someone just for the money she's not really punished or looked down upon necessarily for marrying someone for wealth of course Vijay you know, has his frustrations with it, but she's not seen as or portrayed as an evil person for doing it. Like it's, it's understandable, even though she's not marrying for love and I um, mean, is not living her best life. Like it's not considered some like terrible wrong that she did what she did. Like, I think there's, you know, plenty of other films where when a character marries someone for money, like they're considered like, you know, the epitome of evil themselves, like they're the villain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this situation, that's not the case at all, right? Mina's almost always on Vijay's side and uh, ends up being one of the the heroes of the film. So that's kind of like one of the things that kind of like breaks Vijay, right? Until the last third of the movie, right? There's the fact that like Mina is basically lost to him. Like it's it's evident that he is not going to be with Mina ever again, right? And that on top of like, kind of the pain of like I think he loses his job I think he gets fired because uh the boss overhears them having a conversation about each other and all this shit and his mom dies of course his fucking mom dies so you have all these things and then he's at a party like that his friend is on and they give him and he like gets drunk and this is the ensuing incident that kind of goes into the next part of the movie where he gets drunk and he walks around and I think he tries to save a homeless person who's about to get hit by a train yeah and there's like a weird mix up, I guess, where I'm guessing the homeless person died, right? Yeah. So basically what happens is Vijay gets super drunk. He's wandering around the streets of India at night. Very beautiful scenes. And he wanders across this homeless person and he gives the homeless person his coat. And in that coat are a series of poems right? It is like final poems and a couple of letters. And so Vijay's walking around and this homeless person starts following him for whatever reason, you know, maybe he wants more money or whatever. And we go to the train tracks and the way they shoot the train is also very uh, brilliant because they don't actually show the train. They just show a light in the darkness, which is a great way to get around You're not being able to get an actual train. <laughs> and it's sort of implied at first like that Vijay is like going to commit suicide but then like you can see him like as he's walking across the tracks he's not actually going to do that but the homeless man because the train is coming he gets caught in like the moving and the tracks moving yeah 
And so Vijay tries to save him. And then, you know, we just kind of hear like the, the train come and you don't see anything else after that. And then in the very next scene, you see like he died. people reading in the paper that Vijay died and they couldn't identify the body. And the only reason that they know it's Vijay is because of the letters in his pocket, which for me, that was like, oh, you know, Vijay's not dead. It's the homeless man. Yeah, Vijay's definitely not dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, like, you quickly get it. Yeah, it's not, you don't need to be a genius to, uh, like, figure it out. But but everyone thinks that he's dead. And because everyone thinks that he's dead, Gulabo, right? Yeah. She's like, look, I got to get these poems published. They're good, and this will be the last. He's gone, you know, we have to get him published. So I think she, she confronts, right, the uh, Mina, and she's like, here are the fucking poems please publish them. And she's like, okay. And they publish them. And they're the, they're a big sensation. Everyone loves them. <laughs> Everyone loves them. It's so funny. It's so funny. Like of the scenes where they're in like some stores and they're like, we want the more. <laughs> like They're like demanding to get more of his poetry. It's kind of funny. I guess like, you know, the fifties, you know, there's, that's just how it is. But yeah, it's just so funny that they're like, we demand more of Vijay's poetry. Please get more now. <laughs> it's very funny. And yeah, he's a sensation. Everyone loves him. Uh, he's dead. And you have to wonder, because you see this a lot, and I guess the most famous example I can think of is back in the 90s, there was a singer named Jeff Buckley who recorded a version of Hallelujah, and he released his first album, No One Gives a Shit, but a couple of weeks later, he goes swimming and drowns, and suddenly this album, and specifically this song, becomes like the you know most popular song right across the world, and there's... Certainly, and you know, this has always been the case, whether you're talking about, you know, all the way back to Van Gogh or Monet or whoever, this fetishization with the sort of poor, starving artist who uh, commits suicide. And then suddenly, you know, their, their work is right at that point, right? Their work becomes great. And you certainly kind of see the hypocrisy and, and irony of this whole thing, because as a viewer, like we're not 100% yet that like Vijay is not dead, but we're like, we're pretty sure we don't know where Vijay is. We don't know why he hasn't showed up yet. But you can see that like everyone suddenly loves Vijay's work. And I guess maybe part of it's just because like no one saw it, which I guess is part of it. But I think also like what he's suggesting is people fetishize kind of the poor starving artists and fetishize the sort of death of artists, which is an unfortunate, tragic reality of the way uh, far too many people view art. It's awfully convenient too to have someone who is very talented die. It's inconvenient for a lot of people because if you're the publisher, as it's evident in the movie, you don't have to give that person any money, right? Like you don't have to give anyone a nickel. So you can just like reap all the benefits and all the awards of the publication. You don't have to like answer to the artist at all. It's extremely convenient. Or, you know, if you are yourself an up-and-coming artist or, you know, just whoever, you can lie and say that you knew him and you can make up stories and stuff and he's not around to defend. <laughs> yeah, and we certainly see that plenty of times. And, of course, Vijay is, is finally awoken by uh, the reading of his own poetry, but unfortunately he happens to be. It's kind of funny that he has, like, amnesia. Like, I don't know. It's just kind of, like, <laughs> it's very uh, it's very dramatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What What is that called? He's, like, in shock or something yeah he's like in shock and like he, he doesn't talk or anything there's like a he's stunned yeah something like that anyways but of course when they read his poetry right he, he immediately snaps out of it and he's like i'm vijay and everyone's like oh this guy's this guy's clearly insane like vijay's dead so like their first move is just to move him to an asylum they're just like this guy's crazy incredible stuff like they don't even check or anything they're just like oh yeah <laughs> they move him to a horrible asylum, which I think they established that he's there for a long time. Yeah, it feels, it seems like it. Yeah. I think he's supposed to be there for like a year or something like that, or like a long time, like several months. Awful. Asylum is, it's just like a, a cell with like a bunch of absolutely insane people doing just the most insane shit. Yeah, it's kind of comical how everyone like acts. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the part of the movie where shit is like, oh my God, this movie is fucking crazy. <laughs> it's kind of off the rails. Just this part of the movie where he, he has amnesia. He's like, oh, I'm Vijay. He's like, we don't believe you. And they throw him in. And and then, of course, people that he knows show up to the asylum. The publisher shows up and he doesn't wreck it. And he doesn't say that it's Vijay. And then he meets the brothers who earlier demanded money. And he's like, okay, I'll give you money. But you have to say that you don't recognize your brother. And they're immediately like, yes, 
They're like, yes, okay. Awful. <laughs> it's just like the most unfortunate circumstances of all time. But it's fine. I think it's apt in this movie. It's great. I love it. I certainly did not expect the film to go in this direction. I mean, I knew it was sort of like, you know, things go downhill, but not nearly to the degree that they did or just <laughs> poor Vijay. He's locked up in this mental asylum. Everyone's profiting off of him. How does he get out? Oh, he slips out, right? He gets out because he's like in the courtyard of this asylum and his best friend, Sitar, the guy who does the head and oil massages, is like walking around. And of course, when he sees him, he thinks that Vijay's a ghost, which uh, Sitar is one of my favorite characters, like just a really just a comedic character. Like he doesn't have any like that actor, too, I read was in hundreds of Indian movies and did like humorous roles a lot of the time. I love it. Good for him. He's great in this. I think he's hilarious. Yeah, he's good. But he recognizes Vijay and honestly is like the first person to actually, like, even though he's kind of just like the silly comedic character, he's probably one of the kindest people in the entire film. Like, this is just like a genuinely good person. Like, he cares about Vijay. He's chill. Yeah. And he gets him out of prison. Like, he goes inside and, like, distracts the guard so Vijay can escape prison and... For some reason, the first thing he decides to do is go to his brothers, which I'm not sure why he thinks his brothers are going to be helpful because his brothers have been shitty to him like the entire film. Like they fucking hate Vijay. Like they've never liked him. I don't know why he thinks like now it's going to be any different. Yeah. And like, I think they say they don't recognize him to his face. Poor Vijay. Yeah. And I think he chills for a while, right? I think after that is when he goes to uh, the death anniversary. Yeah, he's like on the bus too. And like someone is like, yep, I knew Vijay. We were friends. And then you walk past him and he's like, get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> so yeah, I knew Vijay. He was my friend. <laughs> yeah, but he gets to the death anniversary. And like we talk about, he has this incredible moment where he sings basically his fuck you song, where he's just like, I'm Vijay. I'm epic. You all are hypocrites and evil and are greedy and don't really care about, you only care about yourselves. And like you said, there's a big riot in the theater because everyone's like, I thought Vijay was dead. What the fuck? And there's this big giant. Honestly, I will say if there's one thing I got to say about the movie that I think is that I feel like it should have just ended there. The rest of the movie is a little inconsequential to me, but it's okay. I think the ending, the, the actual ending of the movie is good, but I feel like the ending there would have been really cool. Upon initial watching, I did think that was going to be the ending because it writes this big climactic moment and, you know, he's just saying like, fuck you. And, but I think, you know, even though I did think this was a collective moment, I think there is a certain power to those scenes after it because it is continuing to show the hypocrisy and also his own growth because uh, after this scene, of course, he is saved, quote unquote, but basically kidnapped by another publisher who's like, I'm going to publish all of Vijay's work, right? And then you have like the guy who was with the original publisher who, of course, is just like in it for whoever has the money. So he's like trying to switch sides. Yeah, his friend, his so-called friend. Yeah, his so-called friend. And of course, the Richard Burton villain likes to call everyone a scoundrel. So yeah, there's another... <laughs> scoundrel and uh you know the brothers try to get money out of the publisher but of course vijay was there the whole time and he like sees them and and i i enjoy not only that moment because you know you kind of expose the brothers you expose the publisher for who he is right he doesn't care about jay like he doesn't care about poetry he just wants he just wants the money right he just wants to make a shit ton of money just like everyone else in this and of course then there's the scene where vijay like gets on stage and, you know, people are like, this is Vijay, blah, 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 blah. And I think that's a very powerful moment because Vijay, because typically what would happen in a film or honestly, if most people, including myself, were in a situation, would be like, yep, I'm Vijay. Give me all your money, fame, fortune, right? Just live a happy life, write my poetry, do whatever. But instead, Vijay rejects all of that. He says, you know, that's not who I am. Like you've created a, like a, a, a false god a false prophet almost uh, fetishizing again this person who you think I am and I'm not that person and he just he fucking steps away and of course there's another riot right people start fucking picking up chairs yeah he rejects yeah he 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 completely just kind of rejects kind of like Badass. the um market based society that is the the industry that has been built around him mm -hmm. he'd rather say you know um you know, he'd rather say that, like, you know, I'm not Vijay and kind of like basically like become 
not himself anymore because he's just completely he he it just I think it's just kind of evident, you know, in this kind of in this kind of way. I think it's like these people don't really deserve Vijay's work. You know what I mean? They don't deserve it. They're you know they're bandwagoners. They're uh, they're greedy. You know, all of his like family and like people that he thought here were his friends are greedy. And and like you said, like him being dead was kind of like a big part of like the mystique of it. And I think he just is just would rather stay dead rather than kind of like can, like go through like these the horrible experience of having to deal with all these just like fake people <laughs> and i love that final scene he has with mina where mina's like like don't don't throw all this away like i don't understand why you're doing this and of course right this yeah, is she freaks so out. representative of who mina is as a person again not a bad person but someone who sees the world that like look like they love your poetry they love you like you can have the money you can have the poetry you can have it all and yeah you know, if you're pissed at these people like just fucking be pissed at them right throw them throw them yeah, out in the water matter. like you know fuck them and just like continue to live this you know wonderful life that's been built yep. for you but he's yeah, like you no. get to be rich he's like fuck successful. it <laughs> he refuses that's badass yeah like like i said you know it's just they 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 don't yeah he's he's a true he's a true uh he truly sticks up to his convictions that they don't deserve they don't deserve him they don't deserve his work he doesn't want the world that he is in is just one that is just full of not that's not full of beauty you know people don't really care about beauty it's like more just about uh, uh greed and um fame and you know he's completely uninterested in that and he kind of sticks to to uh those convictions yeah it's a very uh powerful moment and and with this comes our our final scene where he he comes right. back to Galubo Galoop uh however you pronounce her name and there's Probably one of my favorite lines of all time, which I, I don't want to misquote because I know I'm going to say it wrong, but in essence, you know, he says that he's leaving and she's like, you know, where are you going? And, uh, you know, he says far away from here and she says, you know, how far? And he's like, as far as I have to go or something to that effect. Yeah. It, it's much more beautiful in the film, What whatever the line is. Right, right, I, right. <laughs> it's something like that. It, it's something very like wonderful and beautiful. And I wish I, I could quote it at, at this moment, but unfortunately I cannot, but it's a, uh, it's this funeral, beautiful final moment and you know Gulub's by his side and of course they walk off into the extremely smoky distance very similar to uh the ending of Casablanca in that sense I guess but it's a wonderful ending I love it yeah I think it's good like I said I think the movie should have ended earlier than that but the ending is still good like it's still a really good kind of fitting ending where yeah the two of them they essentially are exiting society or exiting you know wherever they are because it's it's too much you know it's 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 every it's everything is like really fucked up <laughs> well do you want to go first or should i go first you can go first i came into this movie knowing that people really loved it you know when we were looking for an indian well indian... this is like this is probably like i was just gonna say like this movie is like completely random like you completely randomly picked this movie we knew we both knew nothing about it probably the only movie where that we've done that which i I think, uh, I mean, it worked out. It certainly worked out in this instance. You know, we, I think it worked out, yeah. Since yeah. neither of us knew really almost anything about Bollywood or Indian films, we kind of just like, we went to like basically, you know, the letterbox and a couple other sites and try to figure out like, oh, what are the ones people really love? And this one seemed to be like, it, it ten tended to be near the top of the list, but I knew pretty much absolutely nothing about the film, the director, yeah. anyone in it. <laughs> I was completely you know, uh, coming into this film blind and it was incredible. So I think I should uh, preface this by saying that when I watched this film yesterday, uh, I actually watched it in our movie theater, which is the first film I've ever watched in the movie theater. And uh, oh, okay. seeing this on the big screen, like in surround sound, is a truly mm -hmm. magical experience. I, I think it's 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 truly the best way to experience this film. And I loved every minute of it. I mean, the music is fantastic. The performances are great. It is shot beautifully. The writing is poetic. The story and themes are so thoughtful. And it goes in a lot of different directions that you would definitely not expect it to go in. I thought the two and a half hour time was going to kind of push my limits because especially for a film this old, you know, films of this time, like 90 minutes, maybe two hours. I usually, I love a shorter film. If a, I can see a film in 90 minutes or less, I love it, but I wouldn't cut out a single frame of this film. I understand why feeling like the ending where he's at the death anniversary uh, would be a powerful moment. And I did think that was the original ending, but 
I still loved every minute after that. And I think every minute was necessary to this film and I would not cut a single shot out of it. It's honestly one of my favorite films we have watched on this podcast. I mean, it's probably top five uh, films we watch on the podcast. And honestly, I, I mean, I'm in love with this film. I'm very excited to see more films by this director. I don't know what it is about this film necessarily that just makes it so incredible for me. It's it's just one of those things, you know, when you when you see a film and, you know, from like the first couple of frames, like, you know, that it's just going to be a there's just something different about it. And it's not something you can really put your finger on as, as we've kind of talked about before kind of the difference between what we often describe as a nine and a 10 really has nothing to do with the quality of the film, but it's just, it's more internal. There's just something there that you can't really describe. And I think for me, this film just kind of, it really hit that sweet spot. So I've only done this like two or three times on the podcast before, but I'm going to give this film a 10 out of 10. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I, I'm feeling more like an eight out of 10 for me personally. But it's like a high eight out of ten, I think. It's it's it's. I don't think it had as big of an impression on me um, as maybe other movies I've watched in my life. But it's undeniably good. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, like I said, you know, it's just packed with a lot of stuff. It, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's engaging. It's it's just a really powerful movie. Like I said, about making art in a market based um, society. And I think in itself, that's very interesting. And I think it's very astute and touching and it feels very genuine and very felt. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, you bring, you know, I think you hit the nail, you hit the nail on the head. It's just, uh, it's just an, I think it's just undeniably good. And um, it's got everything you would want in kind of like a movie like this, I think. All right, y'all. Thank you for listening. You can find everything I do at Austin Lugo one too. Uh, I'm on Twitter at ADHarp24. I'm also on Letterboxd, Retro Andrew, RTR, Zero Andrew. And you, find, and you can find this podcast wherever you find podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Theater42. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.